Who is allowed to forgive sins? Is it only God? Are we also allowed to do it? Did Jesus give this authority to a priesthood in the New Testament? That's what we're going to be talking about in today's Bite Size Bible Q&A. All right, this question comes with a little bit of personal baggage because myself, I was raised as a Roman Catholic, and for years and years, I went to a Catholic priest, and I was taught that he had been given authority from Christ to forgive the sins that I had committed against God and thereby uh, help me gain entrance into the kingdom of heaven. That was my understanding of it as, as a young man growing up. And one of the verses that is often used to prove this is John chapter 20 and verse 23. So as you can see on the screen next to me, it says, Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Now you might already know that this is taking place on the evening of the resurrection. Jesus has appeared to the apostles, breathed on them, said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost, and then gives them this verse. In case the English is a bit old, let me just uh, quickly explain what we're reading here. When we talk about remitting sins or the remission of sins, sometimes you read it like that. That's another word for forgive, remit or forgive. And then the word retain, that, that's the same as when Jesus said, if you bind something on earth, it's bound in heaven. So you're not forgiving. You're holding on to it. Uh, this is kind of the same as holding a grudge that type of idea. We would use that type of language. So it looks as if Jesus is giving authority to the apostles to either forgive or not forgive people's sins and thereby either allow people into the kingdom of heaven or disallow them and reject them. It looks as if people's eternities are in the hands of these apostles. Now, in order to fully appreciate this question, I need to show you a few other passages. So let me just go through these quickly with you. So Jesus says in Luke 17, verse 3, Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. Verse 4 continues on with this. If he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. Well, clearly, man has the ability to forgive sins. Jesus commanded us to forgive people. But what kind of sins are we forgiving? If a person sins against us, if one man sins against another man, then the one who has been offended, he can either remit or retain. He can forgive that sin or he can hold on to the grudge. So what's important, I think, to be recognized is that there are sins that could be committed against God and there are sins that are committed against men. Oftentimes, these two go together, right? If you, if you are lying to somebody, you're deceiving them, you are offending that person, but at the same time, you're breaking one of God's laws. If you murder someone, isn't that obvious? You've hurt them, and at the same time, you're breaking one of God's laws. So there would be two apologies necessary. There would be a horizontal apology. I'm sorry, my friend. I'm sorry, my brother. I did this or that. And then there would be a vertical apology. God, I'm sorry I also offended you. So if we're going to understand what Jesus told the apostles in John 20, I think you have to first understand that there are two different categories for sins. Sins committed against a man can be forgiven by men. Sins committed against God can only be forgiven by God. And this is why you have statements such as this one in the book of Mark, Chapter 2, Jesus is approached by a, uh, by a group carrying a lame man, lay him before him. Jesus says, thy sins be forgiven thee. So the people in the room in Mark 2, 7, they reply with this, why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? Only God can forgive sins committed against him. But when somebody sins against us, we have the authority to forgive them. Now, why does Jesus make it a point after the resurrection to tell his apostles, these men who are going to be leaders of the New Testament church, why does he take special care to say, whosoever sins you, re you remit, they're remitted. If you retain, they're retained. 
because he knows what an important issue it is for any local church that you are able to resolve conflicts. Take a look at what Jesus had to say to these same men in Matthew chapter 18, talking about how a local church should operate. He says in verse 15, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. So you would not forgive that man what he did, because he has not repented. See, this works perfectly with, with what we saw in Luke chapter 17. In verse number 18, I think this is the key to this. Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. You know, see, this statement was not made only to Peter. This was made to all of the uh, disciples. In John 20, it's made to the apostles in the upper room. But as you move into the New Testament, you see it being practiced by entire local churches. Now, we see an example of this in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, where Paul commands this local church to forgive this brother who had erred and had apparently repented and says, receive him back in. Just look at what he says here. 2 Corinthians 2 verse 6, sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was a, inflicted of many. I believe he's referring back to 1 Corinthians 5, where there was a man who was living in open sin, and Paul commanded them to, to pray the guy out, to kick him out and, and pray that God would deal pretty severely with him so that he would learn his lesson. And evidently he did. Verse 7, so that contrarywise, ye ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore, I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. For to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether ye be obedient in all things. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. So guys, I have, I've already shared the mind of Christ on this matter. I know what the Lord uh, desires of us and how we should handle this. So guys, you have the authority, you as a local church, the members in it, you have authority to forgive this man and receive him back. Now, does that clear that sinner's record with God? No, no, that sinner has already repented and made things right with God. That is why the local church says, because you've repented, we will also forgive you, bring you back into our fellowship. Now, we see this illustrated so well in the story of the prodigal son. In Luke chapter 15, when the prodigal son is climbing out of the pig pen and heading back home, he has made a decision. And when he gets back home, he is going to say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against thee. Do you see that there's two categories for sin? I've sinned against heaven. Only God can forgive that. And I've sinned against thee. Only the Father in this case, the one whom he sinned against, only that man, that Father, could forgive him that. So who can forgive sins? It's a great question, but you have to recognize the two categories. If somebody sinned against you, it is your responsibility to find mercy and grace in your heart to forgive that person as Christ has forgiven you. Now, the sins that you've committed against God, the only way to deal with those is to accept the payment that Jesus Christ made for you. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Jesus shed his blood so that your sins could be forgiven. If you go to God and say, God, I'm sorry, I wanna make it right. What can I do? The answer would be that despite your best efforts, no matter how hard you try, you can never make up for the wrongs that you've done. And that's why God sent his son to offer himself as a sacrifice for your sins. And if you look to Christ and say, in him, in his blood that was shed, he took my punishment, he suffered in my place, and God, I'm sorry, I accept the payment that you have made available to me. That humbling of yourself and accepting the sacrifice Jesus made, the Bible says you can receive forgiveness through his blood. 
Now, if you've already received Jesus Christ as your Savior, you've trusted His blood for the forgiveness of your sins, there's nothing you can ever do that would take you outside of His family. You are His child eternally. However, if you sin after you get saved, you do offend your Heavenly Father. You do owe Him an apology. You need to confess that. Not so that you can get saved again and again and again. You need to confess it so that you can keep your relationship right and strong and close and intimate so that you can be full of joy and walk with the Lord in the light of his word. So I'd ask that you really take time to think about it today. How can you apply these lessons about forgiveness to your life?